thank you very much. Uh, so thanks uh, very much for the opportunity and the invitation to speak here today about um, something that I think about a lot every day, and it's, it's the topic of this book, and it's not probably what you think. The title of the book and the cover art for the book is like a head fake, which is a sports reference, my friends tell me. Um, and what I mean by that is, it looks like it's gonna be a book all about animals, but it's not. It's a book all about human behavior using animals as our way of knowing. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, the inspiration behind this book is I work at a criminal justice, I'm a forensic scientist and a, a biologist, and I think a lot about human behavior. And I work at a school, a college, where we think about criminal justice, which is ultimately uh, an attempt at the coercion of human behavior, right? Trying to shape and mold human behavior. And so it, it seemed to me that um, human behavior springs from natural desires, urges, and instincts that are sort of genetically programmed and um, inborn, and then behaviors spring from that. However, if we want to understand what those I'm sorry, if we want to understand what our behaviors are, we have to understand those underlying drives and instincts and urges, right? Um, however, it's so complicated with humans because our behavior doesn't take shape in a vacuum, it takes place in a context, in a social milieu. We learn how to behave, right? And there's simply no way to see how humans would behave if you reared them without any influence, right? There's just no way to do that kind of information. But what we can do is sort of the next best thing is look at how animals behave in different scenarios. So by observing them in the wild, observing them in zoos, and with careful, gentle manipulation of their behavior, we can see, and hopefully, we assume that their social context is simpler, so their behavioral patterns would be simpler and more tied to their genetic programming, we might illuminate our genetic programming. And that might be a tall order. That you, might, you might have a lot of uh, suspicion about that. So let me try to break it down what my approach is in the book to try, try to convince you that there is a lot to learn about why we behave the way that we behave and why we build the societies that we build. Um, and the way I, the, my logic is, is, is sort of thus, and I'm gonna read a little bit from the introduction just to let you know where I'm coming from before I start into the meat of the book. I think both humans and chimpanzees feel love. The only difference is that humans write sonnets about it. I think both humans and dolphins practice fair play but only humans enact laws to govern it. I think both humans and elephants experience grief, but only humans seek professional counseling to cope with it. And if you do not believe me, keep reading. So that's sort of my motivation for you to keep reading into the book is that if you don't believe that chimpanzees feel love, um, I would say that the burden is on you uh, uh, to defend that because there's just simply so much evidence that they do. If we, if we, if we see behavior as evidence for emotions, um, uh, you, there's no evidence to the contrary, let me say it that way. Um, so what I do in this book is I outline a series of phenomena. So these might be emotions, they might be complex behaviors. Uh, there are things that we humans do that for one reason or another, many people don't think animals do. Uh, and to varying degrees, you might accept some on this list and not others. But um, playing for fun, recreation, some people might not think that's something that animals do. Of course, anyone with a dog or cat knows that that's not the case, but um, th there's much more to be learned than just from dogs and cats. Uh, you might not think that animals uh, engage in, in, in systems of justice and rules, um, so I, I uh, talk about that. Talk about morality and empathy and compassion. I talk about sexual politics. I mean, uh, if anyone in this room hopefully doesn't think this, but a lot of people think that animals have sex for one reason only, and that's procreation. And let me tell you, every once in a while they get around to doing it for procreation. <laughs> they do it for all of the same reasons that we do it. Um, animals fall in love and, and find attachment, right? They form very close social attachments. And I, I don't just mean romantic love, but I mean love between siblings and other affiliates. And the same hormonal chemistry is involved in that. So we could just go down the list, and I'm gonna pick a couple of these to talk a little bit more about, and then I, I can't talk about all of them um, because you, you wouldn't buy the book if I did that. Um, but also in the interest of time, I'll just pick a couple of examples. But what I do with each chapter is I try to, lo to lay out a pattern where the first thing I do is convince you that animals do those things. Because we, well, there's no starting base for discussion if, I, if you don't agree that animals can do that. So my first, my first task in each chapter is to convince you that animals have correlates for this kind of thing. Do they do it the same way we do? No. 
but two different animal species wouldn't do it the same way either. Of course, there's unique elements as well, but I concentrate on the shared elements in this book. This is not a book about animal behavior. There are great books written that just focus on animal behavior. This isn't one of them. Hopefully it is a great book, but not just about animal behavior. It's about human behavior, so I'm only looking at the things we have in common. And if you're tempted to always say, yeah, but it's different, that's true, and there, and, but this is not that book. So the first thing I do is convince you that animals do it. The second thing I have to convince you of is they do it for the same reasons that we do it, that these things mean more or less the same thing in animals as they do in humans. And again, I'm going to give you two concrete examples of that. Um, the third thing I try to do with each of these is try to dissect the evolutionary purpose uh, for these things. Because if there's a behavior, let's say grief, I, I love the example of grief. Grief, you don't think of it as a behavior, but it absolutely is a behavior. It, it's a sim there are symptoms associated with it and there's patterns of behavior. Uh, what do we do when we grieve? Um, it, we show many signs of clinical depression, right? We lose energy, we lose appetite, we would eat less, we certainly play less and we fail to enjoy the things that we normally enjoy, we withdraw socially, all of these things are sort of symptoms of grief. Animals do the exact same thing. So whether or not they feel grief the same way, I don't know, but they certainly behave as though they do. So my point in, in the third part of, of what I have to convince you of is why do they do that? Why do we do that? What is to be gained by grieving? If we, if, I'm a biologist, so I, I see everything as a product of evolution. We are a product of evolution. Grief is universal, so it can't just be an accident or a byproduct. Evolution's very good at getting rid of things that are detrimental. If you fall to pieces when someone close to you dies, how is that beneficial for you, right? Um, well, it turns out it is. And that's what I have to convince you in that chapter is there is a value in grief. And grief is one that I will talk to you about, so I'm not, I'm not gonna leave you hanging too much on that question. Uh, but I have to talk about each of these things and why they're good, not just for the species, but for the individual. Remember, evolution works on, on the level of the population, but it works through survival or not of individuals. So a behavior can't be beneficial to a group and not to the individual or else it wouldn't persist. Um, so we have to talk about this in the level of the individual. So I convince you that animals do these things, they do it the same way we do, and that there's an evolutionary value for it. The fourth thing I have to convince you of is that you should care. <laughs> because so what if animals do this and we do this? So what if it's all the same thing? Why should we care about this? And let me just read again from the introduction a little bit about why I think it is important. Understanding where sibling rivalry comes from helps us disarm it and thus get along with our siblings better. Understanding the biological basis of grief can help us recover from our own grief as well as help others to do so. Understanding that humans have moral foundations built into us through our history as social mammals can help us discover ways to build a more moral society regardless of religious, national, and ethnic differences. In short, I think there's a lot to be gained by understanding the origin of our behaviors. And that's the motivation behind all of my blogging, all of this book, uh, most of what I think about every day is um, I really think the more we can understand why we behave the, we, the way we do, the more we can change it if we wish or manipulate it in some way, why we can uh, capitalize on our better instincts and hopefully uh, find ways, appropriate and gentle and appropriate ways to um, sort of diminish our, our demons, we'll, we'll say. Because, by the way, it's not all gumdrops and rainbows in this book. I mean, in the last few chapters talk about some, some very sort of violent tendencies in humans and animals. Humans are not the first or only species to murder each other, right? And, but most human murders and certainly most animal murders can be understood uh, by understanding what was gained by the individual. And um, that doesn't, it's not a justification for murder. Hopefully nobody would <laughs> take that from this. But I do think if once we understand about power and resources and how that can drive individuals to murder, I do think there's something to be gained from that. Um, okay, so let me then go through one phenomenon that I think most people find surprising, and that is the concept of justice and fair play in animals. So, and, and the reason I like to start with this one is that this is the reason, the, the first uh, sort of thing I put down on paper and said, there's a book here, I, I have to tell more people about this. So I came across a, a, a research article that described, this was almost 10 years ago now, that described an experiment done in capuchin monkeys, where they, and I'll, I'll explain the experiment in, in a little bit, but it basically described their recognition of inequality and, and unfair conditions. And that led me down a hole <laughs> Um, of reading and thinking and contemplating where I realized and discovered and then read more and more papers that were coming out that animals absolutely do recognize um, inequality. 
And I'll give you that paper, there was a video associated with that paper, and I'd like to show you that video. Some of you may have seen this before, it's up on YouTube. But this is an experiment that was done with capuchin monkeys. And by the way, th these monkeys uh, don't live in that environment. This is the testing chamber that they do to perform certain tasks, but they live out in a uh, uh, much bigger enclosure. So these are capuchin monkeys, and this is uh, Dr. Sarah Brosnan. She was a PhD student at the time, and she's performing an experiment where she has trained these monkeys to perform a very simple task. She gives them a token, they return it to her. When they return it, they're given a treat. Sometimes that treat is a cucumber, sometimes that treat is a grape. Either way, they're happy to do the task and, be, and receive the reward, because why not? It's a very simple thing for them to do. They get this nice, juicy reward. If they're ever given the choice, they prefer the grapes to the cucumbers. Who doesn't? Everything is fine, and the monkeys can all perform this task, but something happens when you start to treat them unfairly. So the monkey there on the left is going to be performing this task and receiving a cucumber. Receives a cucumber, eats it, everything's fine. Monkey on the right performs the task, returns the token, but receives a grape. And the first monkey notices this. He does the task again, but gets the cucumber. <laughs> so you're not too happy about that. Dr. Brosnan continues. The monkey on the right again gets the grape. Monkey on the left, is there something wrong with this token? What, why am I not getting what I should, what I deserve? It's a cucumber and is not amused by this at all, as you can see. And so, this is one of these things that has to be seen to believe. I, did, I don't really need a PowerPoint to give this talk, but th this one, you just have to see it, right? The, the impression that this leaves with you uh, and left with me. And this is when this was first discovered, it's more than 10 years ago now, uh, they, tub they dubbed this behavior intolerance to inequity because they recognized that these monkeys, which are new world monkeys, separated us from evolution by more than 40 million years, uh, that these monkeys actually do recognize um, fair play, fair conditions, and they won't stand for inequality. Now, when this paper came out and they made those bold claims, the philosophers and theologians got very, very upset because they claimed that what was being observed was simple selfishness. There was a better reward that was possible, they didn't get that better reward, and they acted out because of that. It was just pure selfishness, it, it couldn't be inequity. Um, first of all, it's hard for me to understand it as a selfish behavior to take a perfectly good treat and toss it. <laughs> so you're, you're worse off having lost it. How could that be seen as a selfish behavior? It's a tantrum, uh, for sure, and therein is the resemblance to human behavior, I think. Uh, it's not a very reasonable thing to do, right? To, how, how could your position be <laughs> advanced by throwing something at the person giving you <laughs> the, right? But something got triggered in the monkey brain that this was not okay that I can't stand for this and I won't stand for this. But the theologians and the, and the philosophers were still upset because they said, if it's purely self-directed, it wouldn't be intolerance to inequity. What you really want to see is a monkey that won't accept the better reward because a close affiliate or, or another monkey, I should say, is getting, so they, want, they, need, it, they need it to be other-directed instead of just self-directed. Now, first of all, I don't think that's quite fair uh, to, to label it as, to, to, to demand that in order to call it fairness. So I don't think that's fair, uh, to reuse the word fair there. But also, I bet they wish they hadn't put it in writing because those experiments have now been done. And Sarah Brosnan now has her own research group and she did the experiment with chimpanzees and she found, of course, they will be intolerant to inequity when they're the recipients of inequity, when they're the, uh, not the beneficiaries, I should say. Um, and that's been, by the way, described in many other species by now. Dogs, uh, very classic exp uh, experiment done with dogs, but all the apes, most of the monkeys will do this. Dolphins, elephants. But the, um, occasionally with chimpanzees, the monkey who gets the better reward will not accept. Will, will stop accepting, I should say. Not on the very first one, but after a couple of tries. Not every time, but occasionally they will stop too and say, this is not right. And guess what? You can dial this up or down based on how closely the two are bonded, right? So if it's a stranger, the chimpanzee's just perfectly fine accepting the better reward. I'm like, hey, 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 I don't know you. But if they're close affiliates, then they'll have much more intolerance to inequity. And I, I shouldn't be repeating the title of the book so often, but 
it's not so different, right? Are we any different than that? Right? We stand up for inequality and injustice when, it's, when it hits close to home, right? Either when it affects us or it affects people we know. And so to get someone to care about others, often all you have to do is get them to know others and they start to care more, right? How many of you know someone who, who has horrible prejudice or at least ignorance about a group of people, the more they start to know and interact with those group of people, it sort of starts to come down, right? Because they, 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 they recognize them as the same. They recognize them as part of self, as that extended sense of self that social mammals have. Um, and that's very old programming. And the thesis of these chapters in the book is that this is very old programming to recognize the in-group and to, to demand a sort of uh, fair treatment, fair play. Um, in addition to just simple following the rules and we, we should all be treated the same, intolerance to inequity, um, animals also have elaborate systems for handicaps, um, particularly when they play. So young animals of, of all stripes uh, will play and engage in a lot of times rough and tumble play and things like this. When the two are unevenly matched, the stronger one is often expected to handicap her or himself. Uh, this is best documented in wolves, where they will adopt a submissive posture and crawl, sort of army crawl, towards the fight, because it would be a blowout if the larger wolf just kind of came in with a stronger uh, posture. But no one will play with the wolf if they do that. If you're the bigger wolf and you're going to clean everyone's clock, no one will play with you. No one will wrestle with you. But if you sort of even the playing field a little bit, you can get people to, to join the game. And that's important because playing is an important social behavior with them, as I, as I talk about in chapter two of the book. The, um, and by the way, we don't, we're the same way, right? Golfers have a handicap. We, we state uh, sports have the class system where different size high schools compete. You know, they, they, we do try to level the playing field because no, we like a fair fight. And we do that because that's, we're, we're programmed to recognize unfair conditions and respond to that. Um, animals also have apologies. They, um, in social mammals anyway, there are, there are rules to follow in a social group. And when, especially youngsters, when they break the rule, um, they have to often approach uh, submissively. And um, do anybody here with a dog ever seen a dog kind of bite too hard or have an accident or do get into the trash, right? And you've all seen the, the guilty dog look, right? I don't know that they feel guilt. What I do know is that the posture is a submissive posture. And that's sort of necessary for them to receive that admonishment that allows them to be reintegrated into the group. So um, this, is not, this is not something unique to humans, is my point. So another part of this chapter in setting up the, the, the issue of justice is reciprocity. And, and that becomes very important because um, when, so, so fairness in receiving something is one thing, but you're also expected to do things if you're in a social group, right? You're expected to contribute. And an animal helping another animal often confuses people if you think about it in sort of very cold Darwinian viewpoint. Why would an animal help another animal? All animals are just nothing but competitors with each other for reproductive success. Why would an animal do that? Well, um, actually, I think I could read this rather than, uh, yeah, let me uh, read this rather than talk my way through it. So reciprocity, reciprocity actually has been observed in a wide variety of species, including vampire bats. And vampire bats, of course, are one of the most feared and reviled creatures in nature. Uh, these little guys go on nightly hunts to search for a nice, unsuspecting pig, cow, or horse that is fast asleep. They generally obtain their nourishment from one nightly meal, eating as much as they can without compromising their ability to fly. If they are unsuccessful on any given night, they can usually, but not always, survive until the next night. However, like most flying animals, bats do not have fat deposits, voluminous fat deposits anyway and their metabolism burns very fast. Two nights without eating a meal would be fatal. Researchers studying the feeding behavior of vampire bats in Costa Rica have observed that at the end of the night, a bat that was not successful in finding food will often confront one that had been successful and beg. They beg for the other to share. That's not so surprising. What is surprising, perhaps, is that the successful bat often agrees and feeds his unlucky friend by regurgitating some of his last meal into the other's mouth. So it's a disgusting scene to be sure, one of the most ugliest creatures in all the world vomiting blood into the mouth of another one. But at the same time, I consider it rather beautiful because what you have is a gentle soul selflessly giving some of his food in order to save his friend from starvation. Um, and, uh, and, and I can show you the video, video of that. It's not gross. I know I, I described it gross. You can't really see too much about what's going on other than that there's definitely some sharing. So th this is from that study of the Costa Rican bats. And you'll see 
And you notice the donor isn't shy about this. He's going to go right up to his friend and feed him. And of course, they can measure this by just doing their, their weight, right? They can measure how much the bats weigh because they're getting 10% you know, of their body weight in these, in these meals. So, oh, what did I do? Oh, no. Well, that's okay. Um, it turns out, however, that the altruism is not in pure and selfless as it appears to be at first blush. The bats that share the food expect to be shared with the next time they come up empty after a night of hunting. Uh, you scratch my back, and I scratch yours. And as it turns out, these bats will remember which of their friends had previously shared with them and are much more likely to return the favor when the tables are turned. So they keep track. They know who's been naughty and who's been nice, right? Uh, if a well-fed bat snubs another that is hungry and begging, the rejected bat will return the snubbing when that frenemy comes begging in the future. So it's not pure altruism, it's reciprocal altruism. And from that, I think we can conclude that humans do much of the same. We are very nice to each other, we, we often are, but we're not nice to our enemies the same way we're nice to our friends. And it's not because, well, I'm going to get something out of this. It's just, that's, it's, a, it's a behavioral program as w for those that we're closely affiliated with and that we have positive emotions towards, we're more generous, right? Um, and it's, it doesn't, it's not like you're going to, well, some people are like this, but most of us don't count the pennies every time we help someone out, right? It's just, that's just what you do. That's what friends do, right? But, the, but that person isn't there for you. Do you just keep on selflessly giving? You know, we often sort of cut a friend loose if, once we find out uh, that they're going to be uh, selfish about it. And this opens up the conversation about morality. And to me, once you have re reciprocity and fair play and rules, uh, you, you've got sort of you're sort of halfway there to have moral decision making. The other half, though, requires you to do something extra, which is recognize pain and suffering and be moved to do something about it, right? And we call that empathy uh, it, for the most part. And empathy is sort of, uh, and I describe it in the book, neuroscientists think about empathy as what we call emotional contagion. So you feel the emotion uh, of, a, of, a, of someone else and you sort of catch it yourself a little bit. It's like, imagine you're at work and someone you know very well and like their mother passes away and they get the news while they're at work and they tell you and you comfort them. You almost you feel their pain, you feel sad, you might even cry for them. You've never met their mother. You're not personally grieving, but you sort of catch their grief, right? So that's sort of how empathy works. It's, it's emotional contagion. Uh, and neurologically, it works very similar, and I, can, I, I talk about that a lot in the book. Um, so here's the thing. It's not unique to humans. A lot of animals experience emotional contagion, and they are moved to act uh, by, by uh, the suffering of others. So a very classic experiment that was done that would now be considered, by the way, unethical by all standards. No one would be allowed to do this experiment anymore. But a very classical experiment in um, animal empathy and animal emotions was done in the 1950s on rhesus macaques, Japanese rhesus macaques. And they sort of forced a, a, a macaque to choose between feeding himself uh, and not shocking a uh, compadre. So what happened was he would have to pull a chain, food would drop, and his friend would get shocked. So they were coupled events. He could only eat if he was willing to give his friends these electric shocks, this a friend. As you can imagine, the, this did not go over well with the monkey. And as soon as he learned what was going on, he was very resistant to pulling the chain. And in one experiment, he went 12 days without pulling the chain. So 12 days without eating anything, uh, which meant he was very, very close to starvation. These are not big animals. So, um, you know, they concluded, wow, racist macaques have empathy, as if, as if anyone would think animals don't, but um, it had, the experiment was done in that, in that way. Um, and many animal behaviors have written about these kinds of experiments, and they sort of call into question whether the experiment was ethical to do in the first place, not just for the monkey being shocked, but the other monkey is experiencing a great deal of emotional discomfort as well, right? Um, and they, do the, they still do these kind of experiments with rats, and they'll, they'll show 
one rat has to endure this unpleasant thing and what can we make this other rat do to, to not let that happen, these kinds of things. And I almost want to say, we get it. You don't have to keep doing these experiments. We know that they care about the suffering of their, of their fellow rats and they'll do what they can to avoid it. I'll tell another story, it's a happier story, because I, I try to avoid some of those for, for various reasons, but I try to tell at least some happy stories. Researchers in California, led by Hal Markowitz, uh, trained Diana monkeys, which are a species of old world monkeys, to insert a token into a slot in order to obtain food. Um, this was an, uh, there was an elderly female in the group that simply did not get the hang of it. Uh, she fumbled with the token and was unable to put it in the slot, either because of poor dexterity, diminished capacity to understand, we, we don't really know why, but she couldn't perform the task. Um, and she would be fumbling with his token while all of the other Diana monkeys were eating. A male in the group noticed this, watched her for a few minutes, and then slowly put down his food, walked over to her, took the token from her, and everyone's thinking, oh, really? You're gonna... But what did he do? He put it in the slot and walked away while she ate the food. So this was a Diana monkey who had nothing to gain from this. This old troop mate isn't ever gonna be able to return the favor. It didn't cost him a whole lot, but he did, he did go and do it, right? So there's empathy, there's some, some sense of compassion in other animals. At least when there's not great cost, they're more than willing to help. Um, and um, there's another one, I, I, I think I forgot to mark this in my book, but there's, um, yeah, I forgot to mark this in the book, but there's a, videos that you can look online of a chimpanzee called Knuckles, who has the chimpanzee equivalent of cerebral palsy, and he's in a, he's in a primate center in the US, in the southern US, and there's something different about Knuckles because the rest of the chimpanzees, they treat him very differently. They are nice to him, they cuddle with him, they never punish him for bumping into them. And those of you who are familiar with chimpanzee behavior, they can be quite nasty to each other. And they're, they're, they're skittish and they push, they scream, they bite. Nobody, Knuckles has never received a scratch. Right? And they're very gentle with him, they'll help feed him, they'll groom him. Even the alpha male in the group will be carry, caring and affectionate with Knuckles. And you can look at these videos and you can just see that they recognize, so I'm not, we're not gonna hold him to the same standards, we're not gonna push him around just because he bumps into us, we're not gonna withhold food, we're, not, you know, we're gonna make sure he gets his fill. Um, and, and what is that if not empathy and compassion? And you can look at these videos online, Knuckles chimpanzee. Um, I would have a tissue handy when you watch because it, it's, it's quite emotional. Um, uh, I might be able to reopen the video, but... Okay, so the last, uh, or the, I should say the second um, part of the book that I will talk about and give you some detail is grief. Because, and I talk about this chapter after I talk about attachment, because grief is, um, especially hormonally, is a consequence of the loss of an attachment. So we grieve when we lose something we're attached to. It's often a person or an, another individual, if we're talking about animals. But it could be status, it could be a job, it could be, we grieve when we lose anything that's important to us, including our own sense of, of status and, and, and this. Um, so the first thing we have to recognize in this chapter is, of course, that animals grieve. And, um, hopefully, again, I don't have to convince anyone of this, but anybody who's had two cats and one of them uh, dies, or, or two dogs even, even if they were not particularly friendly to each other before, they, act a, they behave a lot differently when the other one's gone. Part of that is the recalibration of the social order, but grief is connected to that. I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Um, animals, or, I'm sorry, uh, elephants are well known for grieving. I, I include a picture of an elephant whose mother abandoned him, not, not at birth, um, but this was about 10 month old elephant who for whatever reason the parenting relationship just broke down and, and, and mom abandoned him. Um, elephants like humans sometimes just it just doesn't happen right and um, the you know, animals get abandoned by their parents. And this happened to this, this elephant who sobbed uncontrollably for hours and hours and wouldn't eat for days and days. But despite all the care of fellow troop mates and humans in this case because this was in a, in a, in a, in a uh, um, preserve they eventually got this elephant to stand up, take food, and go on with his life. But it was days and weeks of grieving. And if that's not grieving, what is it? I mean, what, what, why would this animal behave this way? And you might be tempted to use very cold terms and say, well, the loss of the attachment and the hormones are getting rebalanced and has to learn to fend for itself and blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. 
But that's what human grief is then too. There's no reason you, can, you, you can't substitute those same words to describe humans. Um, we, we use more emotional language when talking about humans, but um, that's semantics, because what you're describing is the mechanism of grief. And after I've convinced you that, of course, the animals grieve, I have to then, I think the bigger challenge is to convince you of that it's important that they do, that it's a, it's a good thing that we grieve. And I identify from, from lots of, of research on this, I think two biological benefits. Um, and, and the first thing to accept is I don't think that grief evolved to do these things. I think grief evolved as sort of accident. Like it emerged as the consequence of attachment. So when you're attached to another animal, um, you, you have ho hormonal basis for that, right? You have oxytocin and other hormones that sort of strengthen that pair bond. It's not just in pair bonds, but any, any affectionate relationship. There's a hormonal aspect to it. And that's why you miss them when they're away. Right? And you can measure this. It gets to be, it, it, some people don't like talking about this because they think their emotions are just so special that they, they can't possibly be quantitated and, and dissected and understood. But I, I have news for you, they can be. And they are being um, uh, because we can measure hormones and get them and use them as a proxy for emotional states, specifically stress. So if we use the hormone cortisol, um, and that's, this is true in all mammals, you can use the, the hormone cortisol Cortisol, circulating cortisol levels in your blood as a proxy indicator of long-term stress. All right, so you have high cortisol levels when you're under stress. Well, when you lose someone you love or a job or anything else you're attached to, in addition to the oxytocin problems, the hormonal issues, the attachment, cortisol goes through the roof. And that's the, I think, part of at least the mechanism of grief. The, um, so let, let me, let me and, but we can measure this in animals very easily, by the way, and it doesn't, doesn't mean you have to go around and poke them and, and measure their cortisol. You can measure the cortisol in an animal from their waist. Not their waist, but their waist, the waist that they leave behind. Um, and that's what a lot of primatologists do now, is they follow apes and monkeys around, and they sample from their feces, they sample cortisol levels to measure stress. And let me tell you about just one study where this was done. Researchers from the University of Pennsylvania recently cataloged the social interactions of a troop of wild baboons in Botswana while measuring the levels of circulating glucocorticoids, a group of stress hormones that includes cortisol. They observed, um, oh, and they were also documenting, of course, all of the social and behavioral changes that occurred. And then uh, they had a, um, and, and what they were doing was tracking how it changed when someone died, when a member of the troop died. So a member of the troop would die and they would notice the cortisol levels change in the other members of the group, and it was a strictly linear relationship of who was closely bonded to that animal, had the highest spike in their cortisol levels, and those who were sort of couldn't care less had immeasurable or, or very small peaks. So cortisol seemed to directly correlate with the, the loss of the attachment. Um, right, and when, when members were in grieving, however, in addition to their spiking cortisol levels, their social behaviors changed. They didn't behave the same way they did prior to that, just like we don't. And the point was best made using the story of Sylvia, one of the older female baboons in the group. <clears throat> in general, Sylvia was not particularly friendly. She enjoyed a fairly high rank in the group, mostly due to her age and her dominance. She was a cranky old bird. Uh, Sylvia was overtly hostile to other females when they would try to approach her. The researchers observing the group had even nicknamed her the Queen of Mean, um, however, she was, she was closely bonded with her daughter, Sierra. They would groom each other frequently and spend lots of time in friendly contact. This all changed when Sierra was eaten by a lion. I suggest, I mean, I, I, I guess that's life in Botswana. But Sierra's sudden death plunged Sylvia into a state of depression and her stress hormone levels soared. She displayed all the typical grieving behaviors that we have seen throughout this chapter. Most interestingly, she lost her aggression towards the other females in the group. While she previously would hiss and scream at the other females that attempted to be friendly with her, after Sierra's sudden and, sudden and tragic death, she accepted the approaches of the other females. Sylvia's nasty rebuffs were a thing of the past, and the other females were eager to offer consolation as she mourned the loss of her daughter and her best friend. Sylvia gradually emerged from the funk of her depression with eager new grooming partners, and her stress hormones returned to normal. Life marched on and Sylvia retained her high rank in the group with more friends and allies to boot. 
The story of Sylvia is an example of the kind of social recalibration that helps a grieving animal recover and move on. First, the consolation helps to relieve the suffering, the pain of the loss, and bring the stress hormones down. When someone's grieving, people come and console you, right? So the grieving is an outward sign that is unconsciously a cry for help, a cry for consolation, a cry for comfort. Sylvia did that. Secondly, she let her guard down. For the first time in her life, potentially, she let them come. She let them come to her and comfort them. In the case of Sylvia, it is con conceivable that if she had remained nasty and hostile after losing Sierra, she would have been in a precarious place in the social order of the group. Without any friends, she may have lost her position and any hope of future reproductive success. Through her grief, she was able to get exactly what she needed, new friends. So it was beneficial to her to grieve, because if she didn't grieve, she might have been done with her social rank in the group. She might have lost it all. And so she fell to pieces, which sounds like a negative behavior that would, but it wasn't. It, it allowed her to be comforted, make these new friends. And remember, if we look at this through the cold lens of Darwinian fitness, she maintained her fitness. Right, by continuing on with the group, with the new friends and allies, she could continue to reproduce and have offspring and so forth. So it was to her benefit. Even with the cold view of this, biologically speaking, it was her benefit to go through that. So that's why a behavior like grief can be selected for. Right? And unlike humans, um, almost all other species reproduce sort of all the way to the end. So her advanced age wasn't a, an issue that. Um, menopause is somewhat of a uniquely human phenomenon. So, um, I also wanted to talk briefly about the concept of animal funerals because this, there's been a, a few papers on this, um, that animals have death rituals. And several of them clearly do have death rituals, that they behave in certain ways uh, when they come across a conspecific, a member of their species that has, that has died. What this means to them, that scientists are still sort of trying to sort that out. But that it happens is worthy of note because the, the idea that animals even really understand what death is is, is interesting in and of itself. Uh, but they definitely do this. And it has inspired um, human animal caretakers, zoo, zookeepers and so forth, to sort of try to recreate this. And one of the most famous examples of an animal funeral was an accident. So what happens is there was a chimpanzee preserve uh, that, was, that, that houses rescue chimpanzees, chimpanzees who had been used in circuses and, and amusement parks and all kinds of horrible conditions like that. There's, there's a group in Africa that sort of rescues them, especially when they're old, and brings them to, uh, they're not in any way su suited for life in the wild because they don't learn how to be a proper chimpanzee when they, you're raised in that way. But um, they can still fend for themselves, so if they live in, a, in an environment where their needs are met, they can, they, can, uh, they can do that. What happened was, this is Dorothy, it's a picture of Dorothy here in the wheelbarrow. And Dorothy passed away, and she was the most dominant female in the group. She was the alpha female of this group of chimpanzees in Africa. And she died. And so uh, to no one's, you know, no one thought too much of it. I mean, they were sad, of course, because everyone liked Dorothy, but the caretakers went in and, you know, scooped up her body, put it in the wheelbarrow, and took it away. And the chimpanzees went nuts, and they clawed at the, at the fence and screamed. And th th these two individuals brought Dorothy back for a minute and just sort of let them observe. And what you're witnessing there is nothing short of a miracle, because anybody who knows anything about chimpanzees they don't ever do that. They don't just stand next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, in peace and harmony, right? They're obnoxious, wild, jittery, pushing, screaming kind of animals. This was a haunting, once in a lifetime sort of experience where all these chimpanzees are staring at Dorothy and comprehending her loss, uh, her death, to her, their death, her loss, I'm sorry, her death, their loss, and what that meant for the group. And I, they didn't do the measurements, but you can imagine their cortisol levels would be soaring at this moment. And what is, why would that be benefit, beneficial for them? Well, so the most dominant member of the group dies in a species that has very sort of nasty dominance displays and, and, and uh, fights anyway. Well, if the whole group went into chaos and power struggle and fights, nobody wins from that kind of scenario, right? So what the cortisol very possibly does in this situation is allow a cooling off period of all social competition. It's sort of a, a timeout in their normal social behaviors where everybody sort of absorbs the, this loss that just happened before they start their normal competition again and they'll recalibrate, there'll be a new alpha and they'll move on. But if it all just collapsed into chaos at that moment, the species and therefore each individual in it, or at least a group, uh, would, be, would be worse off. Right, so they could uh, engage, because you gotta remember, animals that compete for dominance don't necessarily do fight to the deaths very often, and 
Um, that's been way overstated, I think, in mostly media, non-scientists. But the um, fights to the death are very not so common, especially in social mammals. They do displays. They do a little bit of roughhousing. But usually, the weaker one will, will, will back away long before anybody's really hurt. But you can imagine if there was a sc mad scramble for dominance in this particular scenario without the appropriate displays and time for it to work out. Um, that would be very bad. So uh, after about, uh, I don't know if it was 15, 20 minutes of this, they, the, one by one, the ch chimpanzee sort of, sort of went away, and they were able to bury Dorothy, and that was it. But now this is what they do anytime a member of the troop dies. And this is what zoos do very often. Anytime a gorilla dies, a chimpanzee dies, uh, uh, um, any of the social mammals, certainly elephants, they let the rest of the group be with the, the corpse for a certain time so that they can sort of absorb the loss, understand it, do this sort of funeral ritual, and, and, it, and they have noticed across the board the, the, um, the more harmonious transitions are the result of it. Because if an animal just disappears and they don't know why, they don't get to do this. They don't get to, to sort of move on in the way that they, they are built to. So um, it's an example of, of how we, when we recreate what they would have really done in the wild, uh, they have sort of more, more harmonious transitions. And so, the lesson from, from this book and the research behind this book is that our behaviors spring from, I think, the very same behavioral programming between humans and, and animals. We haven't been apart from, from the rest of our, our um, animal cousins for very long, certainly not long enough to, to invent whole new ways of being, right? Um, what, we've, what we've done is created a complex culture, right? And that gets passed on from genera generation to generation in sort of this cumulative fashion. So that has just exponentially changed the way we live. But underneath it are the same drives, the same motivations, the same urges. And I think when we, when we think of ourselves that way, um, it's, I, I think it's beneficial. Like, I'll tell a couple of stories. My, my mother called me a, a few weeks ago after reading the chapter on grief, and I said, and she said, I'm, I'm grieving. I now, I, I recognize all these signs. I do all this, I'm grieving. It's because she just moved. She was living in Florida for a long time and she just sold her house and moved. And she's absorbing that. And somehow she found comfort in just sort of recognizing the natural thing that she was going through and how, um, and how the different ways her social interactions had changed, the relationships and the friendships and how those had all interacted, she found sort of comfort from knowing that this is a behavioral continuity with all other social mammals. Um, so that made me feel pretty good. Um, the other thing is, like, this, we can scale this up to societies. This book is not about societies. I, I, I want to write that book one day, but this is a book about individual behaviors. But we can scale these up. And just to give you an example, the earliest simplest and most common form of warfare between human societies is something known as the raid. So this was sort of the earliest way that, that human societies fought one another. And if you go to hunter-gatherer tribes in, where they still exist in the world today, this is how they, they compete with one another. And it basically consists of not an all-out battle. That happens sometimes too. But it, it's, a, it's, it's something that happens in the dark of night where you have a few, a fairly small group of, of individuals, usually men, that raid another group, hopefully by surprise attack, take whatever material resources they can, and often females as well, um, and they will kill men and children, as many as they can, with, and then get out of there, right? So it's, it's a raid. It's a very classic uh, technique of warfare that humans do to each other. Chimpanzee troops do the same thing. So chimpanzee troops living in the, the rainforest in Africa will form small bands from one troop to another and raid in an unsuspecting way, take whatever resources, and often take females, not always, and because um, chimpanzees are a patriarchal species. And they'll take what they can, living and non-living, from their resources, kill what they can, they absolutely do, do commit murder, and then leave under cover of darkness. This is, it, it mirrors human raids in every single way. If you just subtract the emotional aspects of it and just describe the behavior, it's incredibly similar. Um, and also, the way that ch chimpanzees fight each other, for example, is very similar to humans in that they don't do all-out battles very often. If you have two groups, two, two competing troops of chimpanzees, they size each other up, and the weaker one usually goes away somewhere, right? They rarely just stand their ground and fight it out because so many will, lives would be lost on both sides, right? So it's more of a display, and that's exactly what happens in human interstate conflict, right? I mean, every once in a while it boils up into a full interstate conflict, but how often are we posturing each other uh, against each other and sort of hoping the other one flinches? And um, 
by the way, I was in Oakland Public Library last night and someone asked me, um, based on my work with the animals, what I think of the presidential election this year. Uh, the only thing I could say is that sometimes, more than others, it's, it's easy to see humans as apes. Um, that's about all I can say. But I, I, I do think that when you, when you look at human behavior under a sort of, it seems cold, it seems calculating sometimes, it seems, and I, ho I hope that you don't think that I don't have any joy in living my human life, uh, but I certainly do. I mean, I, I, I'm married with children and I love all of them and I move to tears when I listen to music and all this stuff, but I just do understand that a lot of these behavioral programs are the same programs I share with other animal species. Really, to me, if you, if you wanna know what I think is different, and I think the, the fossil evidence and archeological evidence supports this, it's language. At one point, about 65,000 years ago, 60,000 years ago, we became, we became capable of language, which ignited something that we probably had already been capable of but hadn't been using, and that's symbolic thought, like abstract thought. Once we had words and language, not, not just words, because by the way, there's a whole chapter on communication here, and animals definitely have words, but they don't have sentences, right? They don't, they have, they have nouns and they have sometimes verbs, but they don't, oh, I'm sorry, they have nouns and they have adjectives, but they don't have uh, verbs and tense and mood and all of the complex things that humans have. And by the way, early human languages are much more complex than more modern languages. The study of languages is a study of a simplification of language, not, not. so anyway, the, the point is, I think at that point, once we finally were able to use language, everything else just sort of whoosh, but that's a smoke screen. It's a smoke screen for a much simpler sort of uh, experience. I mean, I wouldn't give up the soap smoke screen for the world. I love the way uh, that we're capable of these complex thoughts, but I do think that we behave as apes, that we look out for, um, we're driven by the same things that other animals are driven by. The good thing is that all these instincts can be molded. They can be um, discouraged or encouraged. They can be tricked and fooled. Uh, just to give you a very simple example, uh, all of your instincts can easily be turned off or on at will, and the best example of this, uh, and, and can be easily fooled. The best example of this is that um, people who, who have who, who don't want to have children, but uh, a heterosexual couple, they don't want to have children, they use extensive methods of birth control, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't change their sex drive, right? So they know that there's, you know, at least part of the sex drive is, is for procreation, right? So you disable the procreative aspect. It doesn't make your sex drive go away, right? So you've easily fooled yourself in, in that way. The other way to think of it is as adoptive parenting, right? So in, in a cold core Darwinian view of things, nothing could make you less fit than putting all your investment in somebody else's biological offspring, right? But any adoptive parents will tell you they love their children every bit as much as biological parents do. Of course they do, because everything gets booted up in the brain the same way. You have a small creature that's adorable, which is, by the way, an evolutionary thing, adorableness, and that needs you and that you care for that. All of those parenting programs just kick in. It doesn't matter that they're, you know, you, you, you can know that they're not your biological children. It doesn't make you feel any differently towards them. So, um, that's the good news, because I think that we can shape uh, our behaviors. And the best example of this uh, that I've seen recently is there's a, a group of, of mountain gorillas in Rwanda. So Diane Fossey, who is the subject of the movie um, Gorillas in the Mist, the Sigourney Weaver movie. So she started watching these gorillas in, in Virunga National Park in Rwanda um, back in the 70s, and they've been under continuous observation ever since. There's multiple communities there of, of, uh, of gorillas, and they, they catalog them one by one. They know them, all the demographic information about each one, they follow them and everything. So from the first 25 years of studying gorillas, these gorillas and others, they, they came to the conclusion that gorillas live in what's called a harem structure, which is a single, each group is very small, a single silverback male with seven to eight females, and then the offspring of those females and that male. And that's the only way that they existed. And um, when, when something changes, a new male comes in, attacks and removes the other male. Um, what does he do? He kills all of the children, right? Because they're not his own, which brings the females into estrus and they start to start again. This is sort of the way that they live. So every male that grows up in this environment 
once they get a certain age, they got to go because they'll be, they'll be a threat to, the, to their dad. And so they have to go off and try to take over. They live solitary for a while where they grow up and get stronger, and then they try to take over a group of their own. So it's rough to be a male in this environment. It seems great if you have a harem, if that's your thing, right? But you got to remember, very few of them will make it to that point, right? So most of them died in, in trying to do that. Um, and everyone thought that's what gorillas do. It explains why they're such different in body sizes. The males are more than twice as big as the females. It sort of explains everything. Um, in about 1993, 1994, something funny started to happen in Virunga. Some of the males just stopped leaving the group. And they, they stayed put. They were tolerated by the silverback for whatever reason. And now, more than 25% of the gorillas live in groups that are now as big as 75, 80 total gorillas seven or eight females, seven or eight adult males, and all of their offspring, they parent each other's offspring. It's like harmony. I mean, there's still competition, and there's still even sometimes violent competition, but it's just, it's, everything shifted. It's just upended all their social structure. And there wasn't a genetic change. They're still driven by the same instincts and desires, and, and they're, they're the same gorillas that they were two generations. And now it's, it's been two full generations. They just behave differently. So that's the power of social context, of social milieu, to take all of these instincts and just redirect them into another way. It's an entirely different way of living. Everything about the gendered behaviors of these gorillas is now totally different. They have to sort of relearn everything they thought about mountain gorillas. And um, if they can do it, we can do it. <laughs> so if it's, if it's really that easy, we just change the social context, our behaviors, or, or I should say our instincts will give rise to different behaviors based on, on on that influence of that social milieu. So that's why I think I, I end the book with a hopeful message to say that we do have a choice. We're, we're smart, we're the, we have all the same behavioral uh, programs, but what we have that they don't is the ability to contemplate, right, and deliberate and sort of make conscious choices as a, after a product of weighing the options, right? That's something animals tend not to do. So I think we can use that one faculty that we have differently to build the kind of societies that we want hopefully. So anyway, with that, thank you very much for this opportunity to, uh, to come and speak to you today, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions you have.